manage. Um, our moderator of the day is Dr. Esther Nafula. She's a palliative, she's a palliative care and pain management specialist and head of palliative care unit in Kenyatta National Hospital. Your speaker is Dr. Lee Ngugi. Dr. Lee Ngugi is a lecturer at Kenyatta University School of Medicine and co-founder of AC Health Specialist Clinic. Dr. Ngugi is a pain management specialist and anesthesiologist with particular interest in improving access to specialist pain management services for our population. He has over 14 years as an, uh, with experience as an anesthesiologist. Dr. Ngugi has had clinical training in interventional pain management from the prestigious Edith Wolfson Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel, becoming one of a handful of pain specialists in sub-Sahara Africa. This particular background was a starting point for his increasing engagement in regional anesthesia and pain, man pain medicine. He's facilitated many workshops and trainings across Africa in the areas of regional anesthesia and pain medicine. Currently, he's focused on efforts to improve pain management training of anesthesiology residences, residents sorry, across the nine countries who make up the EXA region. So, Dr. Lingugi, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. I, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you, Doc. All right, uh, uh, I will share my slides. Uh, I hope you can, uh, you see my slides. Slides, go ahead. Doc. All right, okay, so uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Um, and uh, I'm really, I feel privileged to be invited here to speak about interventional pain management and especially in its role in uh, chronic pain management. So, um, just to start us off, I've met a few people who ask, who is a pain management specialist? Never heard of that. Uh, never thought such a thing exists. Well, today, for those of who've not met today, they meet one. So in terms of uh, uh, conflict, I have nothing to declare. No one has paid me to develop this one. And uh, other than just being in the profession and the practice of running a pain clinic, I'll start by just uh, looking at this um, quote by the famous Albert Schweitzer. He was a doctor, stroke the, uh, a guy of philosophy. He was a Nobel laureate winner in peace. And he had this uh, very important quote that we usually find very commonly in a pain clinic, that pain is a more terrible load of mankind than even death uh, itself. So, and and this is uh, something quite touching, uh, especially if you encounter more and more of these patients. Looking at today's agenda, I'll uh, possibly just run through the a few definitions, uh, the basics of uh, pathophysiology of chronic pain, uh, look at its burden and its impacts in our society on the maybe worldwide, and um, again look at how we approach uh, chronic pain management, at least from the point of uh, interventional pain medicine, the team approach, and uh, a few scenarios or uh, how interventional pain management can um, be utilized in everyday practice. So starting off uh, with a brief definition, what is pain? Ask a two-year-old, a three-year-old, everyone will tell you uh, what pain is. But let's look at the science. What actually is pain? There is a, a body called the International Association of, for the Study of, uh, of Pain. They, in 1979, they came up with a definition of pain, which was, I mean, it held its place for more than, uh, you know, for 40 years plus until the year 10, 2020, 
when there was a revision. So what is pain? Pain for us in the medical field or in science and uh, in research, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So it has two components. There's what you feel, sensory, and, but also it has an emotional component. You find anger, frustration, and so many other things that accompany this. It's associated with tissue damage, but not only associated with tissue damage, but also can be associated with potential, meaning that you can still get the same sensation, but there's actually no tissue damage. So looking at this particular definition shows that pain is, as a definition is quite complex. It's not as easy as, you know, knock your toe at the edge of a, uh, of a bed, and that's just it. So it's uh, quite some, it's uh, a complex definition. So uh, why are we here? Is pain, should we be concerned really about pain? I think uh, going back to literature, it shows us pain is universal. There is no society in the world where they found that pain does not exist. So pain is universal. And uh, pain has large impact contributes substantially to morbidity, mortality, disability, and also uh, as a health system burden. You'll find that individually people have, um, it's affected their physicality, their mental makeup, ability to work, ability to participate in social activities, uh, you know, and all that cascades towards affecting the whole economy. So pain, I mean, there's a reason why we should talk about pain. So looking at, um, again, uh, uh, minor classification, there are many different ways of classifying pain. I'll just go through this uh, basic one, which looks at pain in two particular classes. So we have acute pain and chronic pain. So generally, they can be differentiated on uh, aspect of causality of, or what is the cause, where for acute pain, generally, we know the cause. When you have a cut, we can see it's trauma. When you have a rheumatoid arthritis, which started two weeks ago, we've done some testing. We have a solution. I mean, we can identify it. Sometimes with chronic pain, sometimes uh, often the cause is not often known. And what that means is that sometimes chronic pain is a disease by itself. Again, looking at duration, acute pain generally is short-lived, short-lived in the sense that whatever the cause was, once it resolves, the acute pain episode goes away. Perfect example, you get a cut, uh, someone punches you in the head, you have a headache. Once the, uh, you know, the buzz goes off, the headache goes away. But with chronic pain, we, by definition, look at duration uh, expressing uh, older literature we talk of more than six months. Modern literature talks of a pain that is persisting after healing. And when you put a time to it is three months. Again, uh, differentiated on, on uh, treatment in the sense that most of the time with acute pain, with the right treatment of the underlying cause, the pain goes away. But with chronic pain, sometimes we can't get cure. Just like we have like diabetes, hypertension, and so on. Sometimes uh, we have to set those kind of goals with our patients that sometimes the key outcome is pain control, not necessarily cure. Uh, reminding ourselves of basics, uh, what, uh, you know, what's um, the pain pathway. When you look at the tissue where injury actually happens, maybe someone is pricked by, by a needle. At that tissue level, we have the nociception, where we have receptors that respond either to chemical stimuli, thermal, could be mechanical. And that's a point where that tissue damage is converted to a signal. That's what is called transduction. That happens at the periphery and the tissues where damage has occurred, and that signal is transmitted through the primary afferent nociceptors. So you can have uh, one aspect of trans uh, transduction and then transmission. The signal transmitted all the way to the spinal cord. What happens at the spinal cord? We have the next element, which is called modulation. So modulation means what? It means the signal can either be amplified or can actually be inhibited. So at the spinal cord level, we do have that interplay of um, inhibition or uh, you can have excitability. From the spinal cord, the next step is uh, the signal is carried all the way to the, to the cortex. And actually it's at the cortex that we perceive pain. It's a common question you ask people, where do you actually perceive pain when a hammer knocks your, you know, your, your finger? Most people tell you they perceive the pain at the, at the finger. 
But actually at the finger, what you have just no perception. Perception of pain is in the brain. Perfect example, uh, you can go get stitched under local anesthesia. It does not mean that at the, at the finger, you don't have any uh, nauseous, uh, noxious uh, or nociception going on. It just means that you've interfered with transmission and therefore uh, the pain cannot be perceived. So perception is at the cortex and it's a very complex thing influenced by past experience, influenced by uh, emotions, influenced by upbringing, influenced by society and so, you know, social so perception is uh, influenced by so many things. So just a, a basic of um, pain pathway. And by understanding the pain pathway, we're able to generally uh, see areas of intervention. Like for example, at the tissue level, you have local anesthetics, anti-inflammatory medication, whether you're using a gel or you're using something systemic. And uh, at the spinal, if you've ever seen a spinal anesthetic, meaning someone putting some local anesthetic at the spine, that numbs and you can do surgery uh, below, someone is talking and yet they don't have sense. So all these areas of the pathway are opportunities to uh, fashion um, interventions. But is it that easy? It's looks easy but let's look at a few aspects of uh, of uh, peripheral what is called peripheral sensitization what is peripheral sensitization when someone has an injury in areas near the area where injury occurred you'll find they get sensitive you find where now touch ends up being painful what is that that is due to what is called peripheral sensitization what's the cause the area that has been injured is able to release what are called infl inflammatory mediators or another name, inflammatory soup. They are able to interact with other nerve endings close by and raise their threshold. Now, when you have someone touching an area near where you had an operation, for example, or a fracture happens, you find that there's heightened sensation of pain. So peripheral sensitization is one of those things you need to understand uh, because sometimes, Things can go haywire at the peripheral level and sustain uh, or pass, you know, having persistent pain. So peripheral sensitization is important uh, to understand that element. Now that we have peripheral, we also have what is called central sensitization. This is where you have what, what you talked about, the um, modulation happening at the spinal cord, where you have the inhibitory pathways, which come from the brain or descending pathways, and these ascending, there's an interplay. So that interplay enabled by changes at the nerve level from how the synapses, the strength of the synapses, the chemical mediators being released, they can end up either amplifying and therefore you have this dial-up of pain. And this has been shown experimentally where in the lab people get the same um, stimuli, let's say same stimuli of of, of a cut and you have some patients who because of previous changes at the spine they have a heightened response to pain while other people will have a lessened uh, um, experience or perception due to uh, these changes at the spinal level so at the spinal cord we talk of central sensitization which is uh, brings about hyper excitability and this has a key role in chronic pain so chronic pain has several things that uh, underlie its uh, mechanism. When you join all these things together, um, and this is what our current understanding is, it does not answer all questions portraying the fact that chronic pain is quite complex. So for chronic pain, we have, if you start from the level of acute tissue injury and pain, we have other factors that have been shown to drive uh, all the way to peripheral sensitization. If you look at these factors, they're not all biological. We have influence of psychology, we have influence of social, we have influence of emotions, and all these things again end up uh, from peripheral sensitization. The fact that someone has avoidance, stays inactive, they become disabled, again that uh, leads to changes or what you have neuroplastic changes in the nerves at the, at the spinal cord and also at the brain level. So you can see that the complexity of understanding chronic pain is uh, quite huge. 
And that underlies probably why you can see sometimes we struggle with patients with chronic pain. So uh, this is our current understanding. Do we know everything? We don't. Every day, every year, we're adding new and new knowledge towards understanding chronic pain. So looking at the physiologic or basically the biologic uh, aspect, where now we're putting away the social and psychological and emotional part of it, just looking at the biology is that when you have this pain generator, like we're talking about someone has hurt their toe uh, or they have uh, arthritis in a particular joint or uh, you know uh, something of a sort, where, what drives this recurrent pain that eventually ends up being either on one aspect, some people end up in chronic pain, while in other people, you end up with mild or no pain. We have an interplay of genetics. We have an interplay of how well the original pain was controlled. We now know that when you don't control the original pain very well, in some people, it may lead to uh, chronic or chronification of pain. Again, delaying diagnosis and treatment, these patients who are coming six months down the line and so on. So this interplay, again, is um, influenced by what we call the ascending and descending pathways or modulatory pathways in the spinal cord. So you have, and they're not just concepts, they're actual changes in the neurons from um, neurotransmitters released, We've done functional MRIs and we've seen that in certain people, patients who have chronic pain from chronic low back pain and so on, they're actually physiologic changes. Putting everything together up to what we know currently is that the genetics predispose us to having certain changes in terms of certain molecules release. Those again combined with environmental contributors from how trauma changes some people, psychology, uh, changes some people. So the genetics variability together with experiences, what we call environmental contributors, can give these two areas of how people respond to psychological distress, can also affect how you have a state of pain amplification. So the genetics can affect pain amplification or psychological distress on the response, adding these environmental contributors and they end up uh, having uh, an influence of what you're calling COPC, which is chronic overlapping pain conditions. There's so many cr chronic overlapping pain conditions and the influence from the subclinical signs and symptoms, where it is mild, all the way to this transient, where you're moving from say an acute episode transiting towards chronic. So you can see this is our current understanding and therefore chronic pain is not easy looking at the uh, realization that, you know, all the way from genetic predisposition to environmental contributors, stress or psychological distress and other changes in our biology. All that is summarized in what is called the biopsychosocial model of chronic pain. So currently what we are looking is that pain has so many things or chronic, especially chronic pain is different. Why it's so different for everyone because of this multifactorial ideology from the biological that we've talked about, from the social aspects and the psychological aspects. Meaning that when you have to um, uh, handle these patients, you must consider all this. Therefore, if you've ever gone to a pain clinic and see the kind of history that is taken initially, most patients are always complain like, why are you asking so much? Why do you want to know how I'm sleeping? Why do you want to know how is my work situation? How do you want to, why do you want to know what is my social situation? Because for us, we have the current understanding that all these things uh, play a role and they're important for us to consider. Looking at uh, chronic pain burden, uh, every so often uh, the Lancet is always uh, coming up with uh, um, these figures of different cancer, pain burden, uh, and so on and so forth. When you look at chronic and relieved pain for uh, areas where they do surveys, actually most places they've done surveys, it shows that affects up to 30% of people worldwide. Uh, am I joking? You'd say 30%, that's a high number, but that's what has been shown in the EU, USA, Australia. These papers are out there. You can always find them. At the end, I have uh, my references and I'll be able to share. In Africa, I found a paper from South Africa, which again, over a period of time, they found that up to 18% of the population 
suffer chronic, not just chronic, but also unrelieved pain. People walking around dissatisfied with the kind of pain that they're having and that pain has existed for quite some time. So looking at the uh, impact, uh, when it looks, when you look at the economy in the USA, where they're able to quantify this back in 2010, it actually cost them up to 630 billion. This is US dollars, not uh, our Kenya shillings. And when you look at that compared, it was actually costing more than what it, uh, the, the, the country was spending on heart disease or cancer treatment. If you look at the burden, that's quite huge. So you have those direct healthcare costs, people attending hospitals, people consuming medication, people being on medication for a long time and so on and so forth. We also have the other impact. People on chronic pain, if you work in these clinics, they always come before they get an answer. They're missing work. They're missing school if people are in school. Such people don't get promoted. Some get fired from their jobs. We're always writing letters. Even some we've had to uh, hook them up with lawyers because of that. Some have to take early retirement, basically being uh, retired early because they can't cope. So you can see that pain is not just a benign thing, like it's a sensation that, oh, I felt pain. No, no, it really has a huge impact. And while this has been done out there, I don't think it is any different here. It's only that probably we've never looked. Uh, there's the new classification, ICD-11. Most people are still using the ICD-10. So ICD-11 has been in, uh, in use from uh, January 2022. So hopefully, if you have not transitioned to this in your hospital soon, you'll transition to that. Why is it important for chronic pain? Is that for a long time, it has actually incorporated the very different aspects that uh, regard chronic pain. Before, we only had a few footnotes on chronic pain in ICD-10. These are now we're able to communicate better in terms of diagnosis. We're able now to do proper surveys. We're able to tailor our treatments better. When I write a letter and I say a particular code to the next person, whether a person, a patient going to India or wherever they are, we're actually communicating. The main distinction is that we have two main pathways. We have what are called chronic primary pain syndromes. What does that mean? It means that chronic pain in itself is a disease. So don't always say, we can't see on MRI. We can't see hemogram is okay. Do rheumatoid factor the 10th time. Do this thing, x-ray, another seventh time, and so on and so forth. So chronic pain, right now, our understanding is that chronic pain is certain aspects are primary pain conditions by themselves. And we are, we, they've been um, categorized from chronic widespread pain, like we see with fibromyalgia. If you see patients fibromyalgia, they're always coming with this pain that you'd say like it's fleeting one, it's a chest one, it's a neck, another time it's a thigh, another time it's a, you know, so and so forth. Chronic primary visceral pain, again, you've seen with patients with like a irritable bio and syndrome, they're always having all this abdominal pain, which you cannot explain. They've had repeat OGDs, they've had colonoscopies, they've had uh, diagnostic lap uh, laparoscopic surgeries and so on and so forth. But actually we have a diagnosis for that. So. ICD-11 has done uh, as lots of good in being able to classify and see these patients as they are and therefore tailor our treatment for that. So this is the advantage of having uh, maybe specialists in pain who can come and break it down that some things don't struggle so much, some things actually have. On the secondary aspects, this is because chronic pain is related to something. Like we have chronic cancer-related pain, we have chronic post-surgical or post-traumatic pain, like we see with the phantom pain, for example. We have post-mastectomy pain syndrome. Some people come with the CRPS complex regional pain syndrome after, after surgery and so on. And, you know, chronic neuropathic pain. So ICD-11 is something I would encourage when you get time, go look at it, the different classification of other chronic pain syndromes. So how do, what's the typical journey of a chronic pain patient? Now that people have told me they've never met a pain specialist. This is what we see in our clinic, that usually finding relief for their pain is difficult and time consuming. I'm not lying, half our patients that we get to see have had chronic pain more than three years. Recently, uh, I had a patient who had 
has been suffering from 1999. I couldn't believe it. She's seen, it, she lists for you the number of doctors she's seen. She's seen, uh, anyway, let me stop there, but she's had pain for a long time. So generally the part is that they, they go around shuffling from doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital, specialist to GP to other countries and so on. Many come with repeat MRIs. They have three, four MRIs. They have rheumatoid factor. They've seen this patient. I mean, been seeing this doctor. Another one says no repeat. Do another X-ray. Oh, that X-ray is not clear. You should have something, you know, and so on and so on. So they, some even come with multiple surgeries, yet the original pain, uh, as described, has not eased this probably worse. And uh, the sorry part is that so many now we are seeing are coming with an appropriate opioid use and uh, substance abuse. We've uh, lost quite a number of patients who uh, we know that this started on a journey of inappropriate opioid abuse because they are not getting a solution to their chronic pain. And uh, of course, these patients, by the time they're coming, they also have a lot of significant emotional distress. They're frustrated. They're angry. People are telling them, on the MRI, there's no disease. Now you find even their spouses are telling them, why are you feeling sick? And the doctor said there's nothing there. You know, so they come with a lot of emotional uh, baggage. They also come with a lot of functional disability. Many are spouses, they can't participate in family activities. Some can't take care of their children. Some can't cook. Some can't go to, the, to work. They can't participate in social roles. I have like one patient, for example, for her, it was such a big deal. She could not go to church and kneel down to pray. So you can see that chronic patients, their journey is uh, usually, when you listen to them, it's uh, quite distressing sometimes. What about people living with people with chronic pain? These are the peaks. If you have a, if you live with someone in chronic pain, uh, 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 if, uh, of course this is on the on the most extreme, but you can understand why someone can can say what this cartoon has said. So when it comes to interventional pain management or basically uh, chronic pain management, what are our goals? Ask any patient, survey a patient, the first thing they'll tell you because we always ask them at the clinic, what is your goal? All of them, they'll tell you they want my pain to go away. Of course, that is also our goal as, uh, as people who participate in their care. But you also tell them that sometimes it's not realistic. So we always tend to shift the expectations or tailor our management that for us, we want to reduce their discomfort and pain intensity. So sometimes to achieve zero is, uh, is difficult. These patients come with 10 years of chronic pain. We also want to improve their quality of life. So if you are not working, we want to get you back to work. If you are not going to school, some people want to homeschool very expensively. If we can get you back to work, get you back to school, we can get you physically moving. We can improve your mental well-being, ensure you're sleeping better. You're now eating. You can participate in social roles. You're using your medications appropriately. And of course, minimizing harm. Minimizing harm, you've seen it's a big deal in the US. In the US, they are getting almost 20, more than 20,000 people dying a year from prescription opioids. It means they're given by a doctor or somewhere in the medical system, and 20,000 of them die. If you are to translate that per day, that's a crazy number. So you can see that for, for us, minimizing harm is a big deal. Even locally, as I mentioned, we've, I, I know several patients of us who've, had, who've gone the negative way, they've experienced harm. So uh, for chronic pain management, how we approach it, it's not just us in intervention. It is a four pillar structure. We have pharmacological treatments, which may, most people are familiar with. We combine that with rehabilitative services. So we're always working in conjunction with physical therapy, OT, as you've seen, things like improving physical functioning and so on, they're super important. We also have non-pharmacological treatment with our clinical psychologists. We have uh, uh, some we work with. And again, shifting that mindset, uh, shifting the all these anxiety, uh, emotional things that sometimes drive up this uh, chronic pain. 
And again, the other pillar of which now is my area is interventions, where we do certain injections or certain nerve blocks or certain things which complement these other three. So none of these ideally should be used in isolation, especially where you're having challenges. So all of them are key uh, in terms of this multidisciplinary management, management of chronic pain. And again, this is born of the fact that we've seen the complexity or the etiology of what drives chronic pain. So uh, in the ideal, if you had a wish list in your hospital, who would you have in a chronic pain management team? This team should uh, have physical therapists, should have uh, occupational therapists, should have psychologists, should have interventional pain management specialists, but well, generally uh, uh, from the line of anesthesiologists because of the ability to do targeted injections, should have nurses, clinical pharmacists. So you can see having this team really allows comprehensive uh, approach to those four pillars we've talked about. A quick mention of on opioids and chronic pain management. So opioids, of course, are um, mainstay, traditionally considered the most potent analgesic. So I'll underline that traditionally considered because there are things that have come up show that there are things that in certain situations work better than opioids. So if you look in the world, opioid prescribing has increased exponentially. I listened to my colleague the other day presenting this same, same series one of the Wednesdays. Uh, telling us that actually prescriptions in Kenya in the last, I think, uh, 10 years have increased threefold. So that's a huge increase. But remember, again, it's been shown with increased prescribing, we also have a commensurate increase in opioid-related deaths and opioid use disorders. I know in the medical field, we, we've seen ourselves, our own colleagues, pethidine, what it's done to many of them, fentanyl, and so on and so forth. So increased, yes, opioids are important. We need them, but we also have that other aspect. As we continue prescribing, a few people, up to 4%, sometimes in this chronic uh, situation, do end up in this area of harm. It's a definitely something that is to use with caution in the elderly or people with abuse history. So in this elderly or abuse history, or where you think side effects are prominent, then you have to really fall back to non-opioid pharmacological techniques or non-pharma therapies. So most places in the world right now, we are finding that in chronic pain uh, management, even as you consider an opioid, you're also asking yourself, are there other non-opioid pharmacological methods? Are there non-pharma therapies that we can consider early, not as third line, not as the patient who come to OPD every day, every month for three years, now you start referring, no, no, no. Consider them early so that they don't enter into this um, train of opioid use where 4% end up either in death or opioid use disorder. So what about interventional pain management? So by definition, uh, it's usually a mouthful and different people look at it differently, but just to summarize, interventional pain management is a discipline of medicine. Generally, it's a subspeciality, meaning that someone has done some initial speciality. Like for myself from uh, MBCHB, you do MED anesthesia and then do a fellowship to get to this point. So for us, we are devoted to diagnosis and treatment of pain-related disorders. And as I mentioned, we are part of a multidisciplinary team. That is always key to mention. At the end of the day, we are... We do quite a number of things from nerve blocks, uh, we use electrostimulation, we do implant drug delivery systems, we do nerve ablation, infusion, Botox injection, we use regenerative medicine, stem cells, PRP, and so on and so forth. Again, just to manage these complexities that we're talking about. Um, if you summarize our goal is we use different techniques, not just one technique, we use various techniques to improve our patients' lives. Our key one, which we take quite a bit of time, or if you come to a clinic, you'll see, is trying to get a diagnosis. People don't just walk in and then we give medication or we're already starting to inject. Why are you injecting? Why are you giving medication for? So we take quite a bit of time to uh, take a history. There's a pain history, which, as, say, as I said, follows that biopsychosocial model. We examine our patients, review imaging and labs, 
some of them were able just on that were able to get a diagnosis. Again, as I said, told you from ICD-11, we have so many um, subgroups of branches of that and we're able to classify uh, that and get a diagnosis. In some patients where all this does not work, sometimes do have what are called diagnostic injections or procedures. It means where all that doesn't work, sometimes with a targeted injection or procedure, when we put maybe, for example, a local anesthetic and the pain goes away, then we are sure then that is the pain generator. So we do have what are called diagnostic procedures or injections. And then with the diagnosis, now it's easier to tailor treatment. So uh, how do you approach treatment? We do medication, injection, nerve blocks, neurolysis, implantable pumps, and so on and so forth that I'd mentioned. And remember, we're part of a multidisciplinary team. So we, we tend to refer for other uh, uh, other services that we know are key towards successful management of pain. And uh, of course, participate in things like research, participate in medical reports, uh, 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 you know, uh, when you talk to employers, talk to insurance and so on, that a patient can do ABC uh, and, 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 and counseling and education, of course. And that's why we're here, because just to try to uh, give out what is the latest in terms of pathophysiology, what is the latest in uh, treatments? What's the latest in drug therapies? And so on and so forth. So this is how we uh, we try and uh, help our patients. And uh, out, out there in the world, most people think all we do is uh, you come into the clinic and all you want is to inject you. So it's a, a common thing. But uh, yeah, so as you've seen, it's not just... Uh, looking you up and looking for a nerve and injecting. So let's look at a few scenarios. It's looking at a few scenarios where uh, this uh, we, we can be helpful in backache, for example. So do you want to see all backaches? No. Most backache is self-limiting. Eight weeks, most backache, whether you do something or not, uh, it goes away. For us, as a specialty, we like to see patients who maybe treatment has not worked. Those eight weeks have gone by. Treatment has not worked. This pain is severe. It's not just mild pain. This pain is really interfering with daily activities. So you'll find through that, a lot of pain is sorted by many other people, all the way from health center level to, uh, to MOGP, A&D, to other specialists and so on. But there is a subset of patients where pain persists and it's severe and other conservative management techniques from physio have not been successful. So for us, again, we go through the cycle, history examination, review investigations, and what are we able to do depending, again, depending on what our diagnosis is, can do nerve blocks, joints, now we have facet joints all the way from cervical to lumbar, we have SI sacroiliac joint, we do epidurals, depending on uh, if uh, the cause is there, we think is discogenic and so on. So you can see there are various modalities we can use for diagnosis and treat usual uh, techniques. How do we do some of these things? These are typical uh, procedure room that we use. So we, a lot of our injections are image guided. To see a facet joint, you can't see that from outside. So we're using either x-ray, for example, uh, I, I there you can see. The other uh, common modality we use is also ultrasound. So we can see the piriformis muscle if you want to do an SI, joint injections. We can also see the facet again with ultrasound. So this kind of setup allows us to do quite a bit of what we do. And again, keeps our costs down because in a typical hospital, where do you find this? There would be in a theater. So in a typical hospital, if you want to do even an SI joint, which is under local, they have to heap uh, theater fees, 100K an hour and so on and so forth. So you can see, Particular procedure rooms are usually just separate. Ideally, should be separate from main theaters and so on. Uh, this, uh, uh, myself, when I was a bit uh, slimmer, nowadays, uh, not this size, uh, doing uh, the kind of injections we do, uh, image guided. And uh, you can see here, uh, like a sele sele selective nerve root, and we use contrast to be able just to assure that we have targeted the right area and therefore increase efficacy of what we are doing and minimize harm because again, helps you avoid say nerves, plexuses and so on and so forth. So look at chronic low back pain. There are various ways of, uh, of uh, uh, 
getting a diagnosis and therefore linking up to treatment. You can have somatic pain, again, from your examination, uh, question of the patient, you can get to see somatic pain, radicular pain. And from that, you can get various ways to classify it. And therefore, you can also get a schema for approaching treatment. Another area maybe just to mention is what is called failed back surgery syndrome, FBSS. Depending on which literature you're reading, it's also called post-laminectomy syndrome. So what is it? What is this post-laminectomy syndrome or failed back surgery syndrome? It's basically where someone still has back pain or radiating pain, which persists or begins after surgical spine surgeries. Reading varies all the way from 10 to 40 percent. That's it's crazy that 10, 40, up to 40 percent, you know, up to four in 10 patients can actually get either have the pain persisting or new onset pain after back surgery. What's the cause? Uh, number one cause is, depending again where you read, uh, which literature is in insufficient diagnosis. From what I've shown you before, back pain is can be caused by so many things. So sometimes the diagnosis is not right. Sometimes the wrong procedure may be done. Again, the issue of patient selection, and this always uh, follows a cycle. You'll find in countries where before they were not doing a lot of spine surgeries, they start doing lots of spine surgeries. They start getting a lot of this post-laminectomy syndrome patients, and then they start putting a strict criteria on who to operate. So again, depends on the phase where a country is. So in some countries, you'll find by the time they're doing spine surgery, the indication is clear. Even here, we'll find a lot of patients, the indication is very clear, but we also get a lot of patients sometimes where the diagnostic criteria, sometimes they're like, uh, you're not so sure. But uh, as I said, most of our doctor surgeons are getting it right. But again, patient selection can influence or can determine failed back syndrome. So what do we do for these patients? Depending again, we may do injections, epidural injections, dorsal root ganglion ablation, uh, the DRG, or spinal cord stimulation. What about neuropathic pain? Again, quite common of uh, different uh, etiology. Again, you can go back to what we call, uh, what we saw from the ICD-11. There are patients who come from post-hepatic uh, neuralgia, others it's trigeminal neuralgia, others is diabetes, others is uh, cancer, others is uh, from ARVs. You know, so many uh, pathways which may lead to neuropathic pain. Looking at continuum of care again, for many patients, the conservative approaches may work, but we do have some patients who require interventional techniques. So what interventional techniques for them? Generally, we have uh, sympathetic nerve blocks for patients who come with what is called uh, complex regional pain syndromes. We have uh, ketamine infusion, spinal cord stimulation, and so on. In OA, again, uh, is, there, is there a role for us? Yes. We have uh, patients who, for one reason or another, may not be candidates for arthroplasty. Why? Either medical risk, either they have comorbidities, others are saying, let me postpone it for a particular reason, I raise money, or uh, others, uh, and so on and so forth. What are we able to do for them? We can ablate nerves around the knee, and that can give some uh, sustained pain relief for some time. For the shoulder, we can ablate the suprascapular nerve, or and even for the hip, we can target the obturator femoral nerve at particular branches. It's something we do, especially for patients who may not qualify, or they've even had atroplasty, but they're coming with the post-surgical pain syndrome. Headaches and other facial pains, Again, for us, uh, our main area is for the ones where it's intractable. They've gone through a and D, they've gone through physicians, neurologists, and for one reason or another, again, they're always the minority, they're not the majority, always a small subset. For some reason, uh, standard treatment is not giving them relief. And typical headaches, like cervicogenic headaches, migraine cluster headaches, trigeminal neuralgia, there are things we can do for them, including some nerve blocks, and even neurolysis or ablation, if a diagnostic block uh, is found as suitable. 
For other pains, we have a persistent uh, pain from chronic pancreatitis, where if uh, you've had opioids are not working, if you're having crazy side effects from opioids and the pain persists, we can come and do sympathetic nerve blocks. Again, all these are image guided. We do needles, uh, usually with sedation or just under local anesthesia. Again, at the end of the day, we get better pain scores and we decrease even open intake. Sometimes we go to spinal cord stimulation. For cancer pain, we know patients, you'll find that the pain control is not adequate. They've gone through the whole cycle, done several medications. So either pain control is not adequate or the other spectrum is maybe pain control may be adequate, but the adverse or the side effects are intolerable. These are guys who can sleep. These are guys who are vomiting. These are guys who can concentrate. These are guys and so on and so forth. So up to 10 to 20% of patients may fall under this category where pain control is refractory or uh, cannot tolerate uh, side effects. And again, we can interrupt their pathways just like we saw the biological, uh, the neurobiology of uh, pain. And we can do either destructive or, and they do get, you know, sustained uh, pain, pain relief. Again, just looking at the cancer pain, some of the ganglions were able, or the plexuses were able to, ta to target, they're just shown here for abdominal viscera pain, for pelvic pain, maybe some is because of uh, radio, some is for surgery and so on and so forth. So there are things we are able to do for some patients. So what are the benefits of uh, having these specialties in our country right now? Is that we're able to give long lasting relief for various types of pain. We can reduce need for oral pain medications and therefore reduce harm from uh, adverse uh, effects. Through this, we're able to improve quality of life and functionality. Should see some of those patients who bring the chicken, a, a live chicken to the clinic because of unbelievable uh, response where they had really had a tough time for some time. So in some situations, uh, we are, uh, as I said, our aim is improving quality of life and functionality. Sometimes uh, as an alternative or an adjunct to surgery, and also providing a cost-effective uh, solution to the patient and the health system. Who requires to be seen? Uh, it's not again every patient in pain. Most people re uh, respond to conservative measures. For us, what we uh, advise patients who have failed pain relief from conservative therapies, please escalate. If patients have had chronic pain with no improvement, you've done all you can. You've done physical therapy, you've done two, three medications, you've done uh, you know all that you can for them. They've had surgery, nothing is working out for them. Possibly these are patients who want to uh, escalate. Patients who need a procedure to treat pain, of course. And again, someone who's on three, four, five medications sometimes, uh, we're able to reduce that. This is a model uh, based in the US. These are the veterans, these are the former military guys. They actually have a, um, a stepwise approach towards uh, handling pain, and this specifically chronic pain. So you have from the very local or the foundational level where you have the patient, family caregiver, they're able to put ice. Simple things we do, you know, try sleep. Maybe sometimes the headache goes away. Put ice, stretch. Uh, do some relaxation, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And that sorts of some patients. So the, this uh, tiered uh, level of care responds again to one on about uh, how well pain is controlled. And you can see it goes on all the way to these interdisciplinary pain management clinics or teams. That's what we are trying to put together and all the way to tertiary pain centers. Where now, where all measures have failed, now come, we do interventional techniques. And this is what we're talking about, that when you have patients who, um, and as I said, majority of patients will be controlled at the most basic level. But when you have those challenging patients for one reason or another, possibly escalate them up to uh, this specialist to evaluate. What's our local situation? 
If you go to the medical council and uh, ask for registered pain specialists, we're actually less than 10. Uh, why is that? For many reasons. It's a uh, newish year. We don't have that subspecialty training in the country. All of us had to leave the country to go get this experience to come and you know uh, help our population. So we're not many. Again, even the ones who are there most operate in single mode. Like in my clinic, we are mostly interventional and we refer to physiotherapy or we get we refer to uh, psychology. Aga Khan are doing quite well. Uh, uh, they have a multidisciplinary team in one roof where you can get physio and uh, psychology in one roof. We're all trying to get there. So we are few and most are on single uh, mode. Maybe just to mention a few people, uh, like uh, the pioneers in the country, we have Dr. Otieno, uh, who got me actually my training spot in Israel a long time ago. We have Dr. Tikra in Aga Khan, Dr. Mwaka, Baal in Aga Khan. If you come to KNH, you have Dr. Arunga, Dr. Muiti. Uh, if you go to um, Parkland, you have uh, Dr. Ajmera, Dr. Devi, uh, myself, I have my own clinic. We have five of us, pain specialists. If you go to Kisumu, we have Dr. Kelo. If you go to Eldoret, we have uh, Dr. Kitui. So you can see we are not so many, but uh, it's good. I mentioned them here just in case you are somewhere and you may want to get an answer or a question answered. The other key thing we see is lack of awareness. And this is reflected by the, you know, the bouncing off of patients. Patients bounce from one hospital to another, go back to imaging, Let's do another operation, no go see another doctor and so on. So, so still lack of awareness. Uh, this is not unique to Kenya. It's unique in many places where they don't have many pain specialists. And usually you find this gets incorporated in the training curriculums from both uh, MBCHB and other uh, medical specialities. So that even as you come to practice, you are aware of where patients can be referred to in case of challenges. Locally, it's still expensive. Why? Local insurance hardly covers. Very few insurance are able to pay for these patients. They come and say, oh, MRI doesn't show anything. Well, you are malingering. We're not going to pay for the procedure. As I said, said earlier on, hospitals are not set up for pain procedures. They are charging theater fee. Yet for us, we don't need the theater itself. What we need is the, that X-ray and the sterile environment. Another local situation we're having is, again, misuse of opioids. You're finding patients on a fentanyl patch for acute pain, and that's a clear contraindication. Actually, a few deaths have happened in the world where someone's getting a fentanyl patch for acute pain. So it's good to understand when to use which opioids and how. So uh, local situation, as I said, uh, this is uh, what I can say. But I can say the few of us are also doing quite a bit with this education and so on and so forth. So in summary, chronic pain uh, has a large impact on individuals and society. It is complex. We're not saying we have all the answers, uh, but there's a lot we can do for them. And again, we can do quite a bit. In, uh, we are key, interventional pain management is a key cog uh, in multidisciplinary approach, chronic pain. It's not an end in itself. It's a part of this team that helps at the end of the day to improve a patient's lives. So I have uh, quite a number of references uh, that I would share. Just to leave with these quotes, and this is particular to pain uh, management. When you have exhausted all possibilities, remember these you haven't. And uh, yeah, that's why some specialities exist for certain challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for the wonderful presentation. We have learned quite a lot. Now uh, we are moving to the Q&A session. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A session and we'll be sure to address them. So I'll start with the first question that, that was posted here. Uh, Doc, there is a question from a participant whether there is uh, any criteria or screening tools that can differentiate psychological pain and physical pain apart from the assessment of phantom pain. 
Are there any ways to differentiate psychological from physical pain? Right. So uh, uh, thank you for that good question. So uh, again, if you look at what we look uh, when we are evaluating pain, uh, not only do we ask the physical things of, um, so not, not, not only do we ask the physical things of where is your pain, what makes it worse and so on and forth, we actually ask things related to psychology. For example, um, things related with anxiety. Does it cause you anxiety? Is there depression? What other uh, frustrations are going on with you? And if you can see they're top heavy on that aspect of, uh, of uh, like people tell you that I can't sleep. Why are you not sleeping? I have no appetite. Uh, I can't concentrate. I'm always thinking of dying. I'm thinking of what will happen to my job. You can see that by direct questioning, inquiring about that, other than what we are so used to, where's your pain, does it radiate, and so on. So you can get to pick out this or tease out these components of a psychological aspects. And even though you treat the physical, sometimes because of this, uh, if these are not sorted out, the patient will continue to have these symptoms of no appetite, can't sleep, I'm worrying about my job. Uh, I think I'm going to get divorced and so on and so forth, right? Uh, thank you. There's a comment here about, uh, yes, about slow release forms of opioids. Are they a potential source of addiction? For example, slow release morphine that is prescribed. Um, what I can say is uh, generally, opioids used for the correct indication generally and used well, the chance of addiction is very low. So why is slow release a concern? Now, when you have acute pain, for example, um, and uh, maybe like post-surgical pain is acute pain, trauma is acute pain, and you use a slow release, what will happen is that slow release takes maybe eight hours start being effective. So number one, it's not effective for the patient. That's number one. Number two, because it's a slow release, we usually, the use of slow release entails, first of all, you've used immediate release. What immediate release is medication that when you use within one hour, like what we have the oral morphine, we have immediate release uh, oxycodone. Those are within one hour you get relief. So first of all, you start with the immediate re release, and therefore you can actually calculate how much a patient is needing in 24 hours. So you can, and there's a table for conversion, what are called uh, morphine equivalent uh, kind of units. So you can say from immediate release formulations, I'm finding my patients, for example, is requiring 50 milligrams equivalent of morphine. And then now that's only when you can convert them to a slow release. So slow release, never to be used for acute pain because now it will lead to one, you're not getting uh, relief because it takes eight hours or so on uh, to, to, to get so for acute pain and therefore leads to people using more and therefore leading to that uh, um, misuse of opioids. And misuse of opioids is what actually sets up people for uh, uh, abuse. So uh, that's what I can say about slow, uh, slow release that you need, first of all, to have gotten the total usage and then uh, split it over the days, uh, over the day, and then that way, but not for acute pain. Okay, the, I think the next question I will be able to take it. Someone uh, wants to know about management, management of cancer pain. So when it comes to cancer pain, uh, we do use the principles by WHO, the World Health Organization, and the first principle is that we give medication by the mouth, then by the clock. So we give oral medications. We give by the clock means that patients have to take their medication as prescribed. If it's eight hourly, it's eight hourly or four hourly. Then we use the WHO ladder, which has three steps. The first step is for mild pain, where we use NSAIDs. Step two is um, 
weak opioids for moderate pain and step three is strong opioids for uh, severe pain. And the opioid of choice here in Kenya is morphine. So just maybe to mention that chronic cancer pain is managed a bit differently from other chronic pains. With chronic cancer pain, you can prescribe opioids because the focus is on the quality of life of the patient. But for other chronic pain syndromes, uh, we use the approach uh, that we have discussed here that it's multidisciplinary, it's multimodal. The aim is to improve the functionality of the patient, but we do not prescribe opioids generously for chronic non-cancer pain. The other question, Dr. Lee, is whether you see children with chronic pain in your practice. And that does their management differ from what you've told us? So, uh, thank you for that uh, and a very interesting question. So I'm also part of what is called uh, the acute pain service at uh, Gertrude's Hospital. So yes, we do see uh, uh, pa uh, pediatric chronic pain patients. Yes, and pediatrics, of course, uh, do have their own very unique uh, requirements and needs, which you have to take into consideration. Uh, and But the overlying principles are always the same, that you want to arrive at a diagnosis so that you can tailor treatment. Again, multimodal or multidisciplinary. So you work with the pediatricians, working with the nurses, working with physio when indicated, with pharmacy and so on. So the principles, again, are generally the same, but take into consideration, this is a child. Again, uh, when it comes to cancer and so on, we were with the oncologists, if there are any particular procedures. And uh, mainly for us, maybe what we can say is we're mostly inpatient, we see more of the sickle cell who come with uh, this unbelievable, uh, you know, the complexity of handling uh, maybe the painful crisis episodes uh, and some uh, maybe post-trauma, but you find chronic pain is a lesser issue in kids compared to adults, but it is there. All right. Um, one of our guest attendees wants to know how to deal with polypharmacy for patients who have multiple distressing symptoms apart from pain. Sorry, I didn't touch that. <laughs> so he's asking, how do we deal with the issue of polypharmacy, especially for patients who have multiple symptoms? Apart from pain, the patient has other symptoms and you need to prescribe a lot of drugs. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, and uh, actually quite quite common that you find uh, even within pain itself, the patients who are overlapping situations, they have somatic pain that also has a neuropathic component. So you can see if you just give an NSAID and forget something for the neuropathic component, their pain won't be sorted. So there's polypharmacy within conditions of pain. But there's also polypharmacy where someone has comorbids. A patient is hypertensive, uh, is on dialysis, uh, uh, has a heart disease, and also uh, has a unbelievably, you know, pain scores of eight for the last six months. So you must understand drug interactions. That's where now we're saying things like pharmacists come in where you're not very sure. You must understand, um, formulations, and especially be very keen with what are called fixed dose formulations or combinations. You get someone is on betapine, betapine has paracetamol, and then on the side is getting paracetamol again, or is getting tramacet, which has again paracetamol. You get patients on two, three opioids, and remember opioids are additive in their adverse effects. So check rationalized treatment, um, check interactions, Check first line, second line. Where you have challenges, get pharmacists and even a pain specialist, if available, to rationalize those. There are people who, again, uh, maybe just to mention, if you have prescribed, let's say, something, it's not worked for six months. Patients on need for six months. What should you do? Please try to taper down. If that thing is not working, you think you've tried, it probably is not working, just giving them side effects. 
So try to get off it. We see that quite a lot uh, also. So just discussing polypharmacy and uh, how to approach it. Thanks. All right, so there are many comments saying thank you for the presentation. It was a wonderful and detailed talk. And uh, yes, just very informative, uh, informative and enjoyable. Now, Doc, we would like to know your opinion. Can you comment on the use of cannabinoids for chronic pain? Do they actually work? So uh, there's a, it, it's really controversial because there's a legal aspect, there's an ethical aspect, there's a science or medical aspect to this. So starting off legal, in Kenya, it is illegal. Uh, the Narcotics Act says synthesis, handling, manufacture, whatever it is about cannabinoids is illegal. That we can do until uh, parliament changes the law. So that's a legal aspect. Myself, Dr. Arunga and a few others have worked in places where we could prescribe uh, cannabinoids before. And yes, they have their role. Uh, the science is growing. So there are particular areas in science where it's uh, uh, been shown to be effective. We know in epilepsy, childhood, certain categories of epilepsy, cutting certain categories of uh, neuropathic pain, certain categories of uh, cancer pain. There is efficacy. It's not very strong, but even when we used to prescribe it before, it was not first line and not second line. It was always third or fourth line in combination and with certain um, uh, safeguards in that country, you have to be on a database because what stops you from going to, uh, maybe in the morning you come to Dr. Ngugi, gives you some cannabinoids or prescribes. Tomorrow you walk into Dr. Anafula's prescribes. So you need like centralized databases. So a lot has to be done before a country. Okay, of course a country can legalize, but the proper way uh, a lot has to be done to, to, to do that. So there's evidence, but in Kenya, it is remains illegal. All right. Now, uh, what about alternative medicine? Someone asks if there is a role for complementary or alternative medicine in chronic pain management. He or she has not specified what they mean by alternative medicine. So, uh, that, uh, actually, really good you brought that one up. Yes, we have... Uh, evidence for many other types. If you go to China, even not even China, go US, go UK, there are pain clinics, hospitals that provide acupuncture, for example. We see things like massage. So yes, it does have a role. And the goodness of a lot of this alternative medicine is that the side effect profile is not bad. A lot of them don't have side effects. So, and they do help in certain patients, as you saw from the biopsychosocial model of chronic pain, chronic pain is quite complex. So we, I would not say don't do it, but again, check it up, just like everything else, check it up. The ones which are easy without side effects, heat, cold, uh, acupuncture, massage, those ones do them very well. The ones where you have to ingest or inject certain uh, things where medical council or certain medical councils have not uh, given a go ahead or a license, be more careful with those ones where people are saying, you know, you can inject you, you can ingest something. So that's what I've said. So yes, alternative uh, has a role. All right. Now the final question is about side effects of nerve ablation. Are there any side effects? Right, so um, again, uh, we'll just start with the same blanket statement. There's nothing done in a hospital that has no risk. So the first thing we, before any procedure or any treatment, we talk about risks. So how does nerve ablation work? There are two ways. There's a chemical where you're injecting something that denatures proteins, like for example, conch, alcohol, glycerol, phenol, targeted. Uh, and there's the other way, you're either using laser, or you're using radio frequency ablation. So all of them at the end of the day is to reduce transmission in that nerve. So they, in lack of a better word, they cook the nerve, uh, whether heat, cold, 
to reduce. So by the time the nerve is regenerating, maybe nine months, 10 months later, someone has had some, some sustained pain relief. So common side effects is that if you've not targeted your needle well, and that's why you use ultrasound, that's why you use II, you may damage other tissue, you may damage a motor now. If you damage a motor now, that means paralysis in that particular area. So you really must go to someone who knows what they're doing, who have experience and know exactly what they're doing. You may get burning sensations. And some people get up and end up having numbness, because remember, it's the same sensory nerve that carries information. So those are the common uh, said, common things are minor things, numbness, soreness in that area. Serious things are very rare, like paralysis or, or the, uh, uh, and, and, and that's why you move more to the radio frequency and laser more than neurolysis with the chemicals. All right, thank you. So uh, we seem to have lost Dr. Nafula. Uh, kindly proceed, Dr. Lee, if you have additional comments. Sorry, I so got I, disconnected. I, yeah. Yes, Doc, you are saying yeah. something? Yes. I, I, I'd finished uh, talking about uh, yes. <laughs> Nava I, I don't know if you have any other questions. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, I, I, yes. So, so I, I, I'd say the uh, common side defects are minor, serious side defects are rare, and they usually avoid serious side defects by having someone knows what they're doing by using image guidance. That's why I talked about the X-rays and the ultrasounds that we use, and again moving away from chemical neurolysis to radio frequency or a laser where you're just burning at the tip of the needle compared to chemical image, which may spill uh, you know, a bigger surface area. So there are ways to try and minimize, uh, but it's quite handy, works very well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for accepting to be our speaker this fine afternoon. We have learned quite a lot. Uh, the pain management series continues. Our next webinar will be in September. We will send out the invitation early enough. Thank you everyone for sparing your time to attend this session. We hope that you've learned something new and that your practice in managing patients with pain is going to improve for the better. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.